Okay, so um, are there any questions? I'll give you some exercises for you to work on at the end of the class, okay? Um, so before we get into finally proving the statement about the fundamental group of the circle, we, let me, let's recall the definition of covering, okay? Everybody happy with the definition of covering? Now, I forgot to ask or to discuss the simplest possible type of covering there is. Okay, so let's, let's review the, the, the concept. We have a space X, a map P from another space Y, and each point down in X has a neighborhood that is evenly covered, which means that uh, the pullback by the map P consists of sort of slices that look let's say in words, basically the same as the one below, or more precisely, the map P is a homeomorphism. What's the, the simplest possible example of a covering, which I failed to say? Identity. What do you mean by that? Okay, okay, so he's saying let's take the space Y to be the same space X and the map P to be the identity. That's kind of a pretty um, sort of simple uh, kind of covering. I'm thinking of something a little more elaborate, not a whole lot more. We can elaborate on that same idea, but instead of just having one sort of think of the space as one big pancake below, instead of just having one copy on top, you can have many copies on top. Okay, sorry, I didn't interrupt. What, what was you going to say in your yellow shirt? Oh, sorry. Is something like that? Or, or you have something else to add? No? Okay, so if you take, um, so, a tr so for natural reasons, this is called a trivial covering. So you would have X, Y, P, and Y is X crossed with a set T, a completely arbitrary set T, with the discrete topology. So that's a, a precise way to describe something like what we were saying in, in words. So here T, say for example, are the integers. Uh, with just the discrete topology, so every point is um, isolated, so it's itself a, an open set. So we would have the map P, which is simply going down and mapping to the point in X corresponding. So this is kind of a boring type of covering, but it certainly is a covering. And um, you can, with this notion, you can think of a actual covering as something that looks like this locally. So another way to say the same thing of a definition of covering is that if you take a small enough neighborhood of your space X below and you look what happens on top of that set and forget the rest, it looks like this. It looks like a trivial covering. And so another way to say what a covering is is that it's locally a trivial covering. Okay, so if you concentrate on a small enough open set around a given point, it looks like a trivial covering. So this is a concept that appears in math, of course, in many different contexts where the notion of locally could be um, defined in a somewhat abstract way. You often are interested in things that are locally trivial but not overall trivial, and you want to understand the abstraction from how much they differ from being trivial. Okay, so back to uh, the fundamental group of the circle. We finally can discuss it more precisely. So we take, let's say, the point one, and the map to Z, which we claim is an isomorphism, is the winding number, which we can define it, although I didn't do it. Um, sorry, I don't know why I put the till. Uh, I didn't actually do it but you can um, find it in Fulton's book, for example. You can do this uh, simply with calculus, but we also can do it more abstractly uh, with our uh, uh, covering 
idea and with the uh, lifting of uh, paths um, that we discussed last time. So how do I define the winding number? Um, well, we know there is a lift of this map, of this path, uh, to the covering. So recall that we have R and S1 and the map P. And so any path in the space below can be lifted uniquely to a path upstairs in the space Y of the covering if you fix where it begins. And um, the difference between where it ends and where it begins is in the case of this covering an integer. And um, this integer, we call it the winding number. And this number doesn't depend on uh, the path, the loop gamma itself. It only depends on the homotopy class because uh, if you had another path, gamma prime, that is homotopic to gamma, they both lift to paths in the covering, but also does the homotopy between them. So the homotopy below lifts also, and so in particular, the ending points of the lifts are the same. So if you fix, for example, uh, to fix ideas, you say gamma twiddle of zero is zero, then wherever gamma twiddle ends will be uniquely determined by the homotopy class, not by the actual path that you use to represent it. Okay, so this is a well-defined um, map or the concept of the, the number W of gamma is well-defined because of the lifting uh, properties of coverings that we proved last time. So both the fact that there are lifts of uh, paths unique lifts of paths and unique lifts of homotopies. Okay, so let's prove this uh, statement. So already I elaborated a bit about why this map is itself well defined, which is part of the proof. But let's say, uh, and I think we argued this already, but just to uh, sync this concept in better. Let's convince ourselves that the map is surjective. So there is a path of any given winding number. And what do we say? How do we do see that? I give you an, an integer n. What is a path in the circle that has winding number n? It goes n times around the circle. We discussed this, so let's see how this goes. Say, let's call it omega n, and is the path that goes from s. Let me just say e to the 2 pi i n s to save some ink, because that's the same as cosine 2 pi s, 2 pi n s, and sine 2 pi n s. Okay, now, why don't we actually um, compute completely explicitly, because we can do it, what is the lift of this omega n? Okay? If anything else, to practice this concept and get it clear, as clear as possible in our heads. So what is omega n twiddle, a lift to r? And just to fix ideas, let's just say that, uh, sorry, the yeah, omega n of zero is um, zero. Okay, so um, our base point is the number one in the complex numbers in the circle. Okay, so a picture would be this. Let's say that this is our base point. And so the covering is from R to S1 and suddenly zero is on top of one because it's e to the two pi i zero. 
So zero is in the pre-image of one by the map P. And let's agree that our lifts start there. OK, so what is this omega n? As we proved last time, there's a unique path that lifts omega n and starts at zero. So what is it? Sorry? n times t. So oh, let me try to keep my notation straight and call it s, as I was doing in Hatsu does. So it would be s goes to n s. OK? So this is a path from the interval. This goes from the interval i to r. Certainly is a continuous map. And it projects down to omega n, because in this case, projecting is taking the exponential of e to pi i of the argument. And that's exactly what our path omega n is. And because this is a lift, we know it's the lift, because there is, we know it's a unique one such. OK, so in particular, omega n twiddle of 1 minus omega n twiddle of 0, which is 0, but I write it for completeness, is n minus 0, that is n. So this path omega n, indeed, as we knew all along and we already mentioned, has winding number n. But we, you know, they, what we're doing here is proving things rigorously. And this is an um, example of this. And we've done it without calculus. I mean, this is now pure algebraic topology. OK. Now, suppose you have a path, a homotopy class of loops, of, a, of loop in um, the fundamental group. OK. And let's say that its winding number is n. OK. So how do we see that? Omega is homotopic to omega n. This will show that the map that we have defined is injective. Okay, that um, any path, any um, class in pi one of the circle is accounted for by omega n and only one such n. OK, so how, how do we see this? And uh, let me do it slowly, because the, the arguments that we're going to use only use the properties of, of coverings and one property of the reals. The thing to, to focus here is that you know, the way historically and the way we're, we're learning mathematics is you learn calculus, you, know, you, you get used to certain things. And then slowly you abstract the notions that are relevant, and then you, you can expand your theory to include things where you don't have the real numbers, places where you don't have the crutches of being able to differentiate, for example. So um, let's just try to reason this, not by using any calculus, but uh, by using the, the tools of topology that we have so far. And so the same tools would then apply. And you'll see that the only properties that we need uh, are one that the, that the uh, map is a covering and one very simple property of the real numbers. OK, so let's consider a lift. So we know it exists. And like, let's just, again, fix ideas and say that it starts at 0. OK. And we also have omega n. OK, starting at the same place. OK. Um, how, do we, how can we see that omega, uh, sorry, that gamma and omega n are homotopic? We lifted both paths. What happens with these paths upstairs? 
same endpoints. Everybody agree with that? Why is that? Well, um, by definition, gamma lifts to something that ends in n. That's the winding number. And we just checked that omega n total ends at n. Okay? So they both start at 0 and end at n. So they are homotopic because, because R is simply connected because R has trivial fundamental group. So all we're going to use of the real numbers is the fact that it's simply connected. Is that, is that clear? So we use the covering map to lift both paths. We have chosen so that they start and end exactly the same places, and they are paths in a simply connected space. Okay? Um, so that means that we can, um, they're both are going to be homotopic. So, in fact, how do you prove that? We have a simply connected space and two maps that go from one point to another. Why are they homotopic? Okay, so what he's saying is that you take the first one going one way and take the other one coming back. And uh, this will give you now a loop because they end at the same spot. The same spot. And that loop, because the space is simply connected, contracts. Uh, it, it's a trivial, um, uh, has a homotopy class of a point, And this will give you a homotopy between the two paths. Okay, you would have to fill in a few of the details, but that... So the, we use the fact that we have a covering and the fact that the space upstairs is simply connected. That's all we're going to use of this, the topology of the situation. So we can apply exactly this, uh, this argument in a similar situation. Okay, so if you like, concretely, because we are in the, in the reals, you can actually write down the homotopy, right? which we've done before. It's just a linear homotopy. But that is not relevant, the fact that you have it explicitly or that is linear. Okay, so because R is simply connected, um, omega twiddle is homotopic to omega n twiddle, and then applying the covering map down, we get the gamma, not e equal but homotopic, this is omega n, and so gamma and omega n are homotopic. Okay, so that means that this map is surjective, we saw that, and it's also injective because um, any loop in the circle in the base is homotopic to one of these omega n's. And it has to be only one possible omega n because n is where the lift ends. If it ended at a different number m, then it cannot be homotopic to uh, the one you started with. So the point is omega n and omega m are not homotopic if n and m are distinct because n and m are where the lifts finish and um, if n and m are distinct, then they end at different places and their classes cannot be the same. Because the classes, what we saw before, determine um, the, the, where it ends determines what um, its, um, its class is. Okay, so uh, we would have to check that the map that we constructed is a homomorphism, but um, this will follow if we check this. And so how would you check that?
property of multiplication? Okay, I think you may, um, yeah, I think it's along the right lines. You're saying that you, we take the, if I understood correctly, you were saying you take the paths and you multiply them. Is that what you're saying? But you have to be careful, and this is a point that we may come back to. As it happens, S1 is a, circ is a group, right, uh, with multiplication of complex numbers, for example, or just angles, right? So there are two things you can do with two paths. You can take the paths and actually multiply them in the group. Okay? And that will give you a third path. But that's not quite, this is something you cannot do if your space is not a group. Okay? So I think I'll postpone discussing that for later. But let's stick to the. Um, the notion of multiplication of paths that we have discussed. I think it's what you're referring to, but just to clarify it. So how would you do this? You have to, we didn't really do it in, in detail, and I'm asking you to do it in the homework. But basically, in words, what is it we do? We, we have two paths, and we want to multiply them, or rather the homotopy classes. But we start with a path from one class, and then we, we um, in general, you go from one point to another, and the next path has to start where the other one ends in order to be able to multiply them, and then you basically follow it out, right? So you do that with this, and so what happens? Uh, omega n, when you, when you lift it, goes from 0 to n, and omega m goes from 0 to m. When you multiply them, what you're going to do is you're going to shift the second one. You know, the first one goes from 0 to m, and then you follow that by going from 0 to n, from that point on. And so where it's going to end is going to end in, w, in n plus m. OK, but, um, and that we know means that its class is the class of omega n plus m. So I'll have, to, I'll, have I'll leave the details um, to be worked out by you. It's not difficult, but it's one of those things that I uh, think we can save a little uh, tediousness by moving forward. OK. So this will show you, show us that the map is a homomorphism, is bijective, and it will prove what we were saying. So just uh, to summarize, what turned out to be Useful facts that we used were one that R to S1 is a covering. We have a covering map. And two, that R is simply connected. So this situation where you have a space and a cover of it where the top space is simply connected is a very useful situation. And you use it very much in the same way we just did. And what we can say is that R is, is called the universal cover of the circle. So it's a connected, simply connected covering of the space. OK. So that's um, a very important situation. And I don't know how much I will be able to fill out this, this statement. But if you know a bit of Galois theory and you like that point of view of algebras, um, this you should think of a field, and then the top thing is like the Galois closure. And the fundamental group will play the role of the Galois group of the algebraic closure over the field itself. Okay, but I'm not sure I'll be able to, to fill out 
many de more details about this relation than just what I just said. Okay, so that's good. We now have done something fairly uh, substantial that is a, a result that we talked about already in, even in the first class, but now we actually have all the tools to, to do it, to prove it rigorously. And we did it with just algebraic topology, not with any other notions that don't easily extend like uh, metric spaces or differentiation or anything relating to the real numbers. Okay, so let's do some application. This is a fun application of the things that we know. And as Hasser says, typically we use algebra to inf inform topology. Now we're going to go back. We're going to use topology to prove something in algebra. So we're going to prove the fundamental theory of algebra. Okay, which says that any polynomial of degree bigger than zero, so non-constant, has a root in the complex numbers. Okay, so I don't know how long ago you've seen this result, and you probably take it for granted, because you've sort of incorporated it and just becomes part of what you know. You don't stop, stop to think about it, but it needs a proof. It's, you know, you start with the real numbers. You may be fairly comfortable with the real numbers. Suddenly, you add one thing, i, and then out of a sudden, uh, you get the roots of everything. You know, i is the root of one polynomial, x squared plus 1. But you, you adjoin one root of one polynomial, and suddenly every other polynomial there is also has a root. That's a pretty strong fact. So if the degree of p is bigger than zero, P has a root in C. Okay, so let me first uh, sort of break this up into steps. The first step has um, no, um, it's sort of a independent, uh, a result of independent interest, which is something that you may want to incorporate in the tools that you have which is, will tell us a bound of where we are, we are going to be sure there is a root. Okay, so, so let's fix ideas. And let's say the polynomial P of X is X to the N plus A1 X to the N minus 1, A1 X plus A0. So divide out the leading coefficient so it's monic. It doesn't hurt any of the arguments. So n here is the degree of the polynomial. And so the first point I want to make is that if r is a number, real positive number, bigger than the absolute value of a1 up to a0 and bigger than 1, so bigger than the um, the two numbers bigger than the max. And uh, then P um, does not vanish on the circle of radius of any, any point of um, norm bigger than r. So in symbols, it would be that p of x does not vanish on x bigger or equal to r in the complex numbers. So this is a little bit of calculus. So let's take a point x with radius with um, yeah, sitting in a circular radius r in the origin, around the origin. Then um, absolute value of x to the n 
is r to the n. r to the n is r times r to the n minus 1. The first factor by assumption is bigger than the absolute value of the sum of the a's, the sum of the absolute values of the a's. And the r n minus 1 is x to the n minus 1. But uh, since r is bigger than 1, this x n to the uh, n minus 1, we can distribute it like this. And so um, that means that if p of x was 0, we would get that um, r to the n is minus a1x to the n minus 1, a1x plus a0. And if you... Um, This is x. Um, if we um, take absolute values of this, we will get a contradiction. So r to the n is equal to the absolute value of this. And this is a contradiction. So. This was assuming that we had a root on the circle exactly radius r, but this is true for any r was anything bigger than that bound of the sum of the absolute values of the a's and 1, so this is true for all such circles. So this is good to know because usually we can think of, we, we use this the other way around. So since it cannot vanish outside this disk and we are going to prove it vanishes somewhere, it has to vanish inside. So it will have a root inside. In fact, all the roots are going to be inside this big circle. So if you ever wonder, you know, how big can the root of a polynomial uh, be if you have one in your hands, this is a simple-minded, um, not too bad, pro uh, bound for where the zeros of your polynomial must be. Okay, so that's point one. Okay, so now let's look at the path um, loop, to be more precise, uh, then um, this, uh, so we're going to have two loops. Let's look at the map from x to px over the absolute value of px. Actually, um, let me do, yeah, so I'll, I'll do this for two polynomials, p0 and p1. So p0, I'm taking it to be x to the n p1 of x to be the rest of the polynomial that make up p. Oops, I think I've been uh, writing the indices wrong. So please um, correct them if you wrote them. So I, I think I keep calling both of them a1. Okay, so p is by definition p0 of x plus p1 of x. And if we assume um, that, sorry, uh, P1, sorry, excuse me, let me go back a second. I'm getting confused. Sorry, let me write this correctly. So P0 is what I wrote, but I want P1 just to be P. So let me write this again. So P0, I take it to be 
x to the n and p1 of x to be just um, p, our polynomial p. And we let's have x move in the circle of radius r, the same r that we picked before. So we know that the polynomial does not vanish on that circle. So if we look at p0 of x over the absolute value of p0 of x, well, that's just x to the n is um, at, on the circle is um, x to the n divided by r to the n. Um, the absolute value of x is uh, r on that circle. And then, so this would be our gamma 0. And our gamma 1 is going to be p of x divided by absolute value of p of x. And because we're assuming it doesn't vanish on this circle, um, well, we proved it doesn't vanish with our choice of r, then these uh, paths are well defined and gives us maps from the circle to the complex numbers. In fact, um, because we're dividing by the absolute value, the map to the unit circle. So this is not quite the unit circle. It's a circle of radius r, but um, easily we can shrink, uh, shrink it to scale it so that it is. So we get maps from S1 to S1, and uh, these are loops um, sort of um, with base point, say, um, x equals 1. Um, so a loop is, which we said is a map, continuous map from the interval 0, 1 to the space that ends where it begins. But that's the same as saying that we have a continuous map from the circle to the space where um, a given point in the circle uh, maps to your chosen base point. So these are two uh, loops in S1. Is that right? Are you happy with this? OK. So um, what is the path gamma 0? We've seen it before. So it's um, is ignore the r. The r is just a scaling factor. Is uh, essentially x goes to x to the n, right? So what kind of path does that give? What's the path in the unit circle given by the map x goes to x to the n, if you think of x as a complex number in the unit circle? Come on, guys. We've done it before. Yeah? It goes around n times. So is the path gamma, is the path gamma n, omega n, right? And um, so a sec second. Um, OK, <clears throat> so um, gamma 0 is our friend gamma omega n. And this gamma 1 is some other path. But we can consider p sub t to be uh, x to the n plus t a1 x to the n minus 1, sorry, a n minus 1 up to a1x plus a0, right? So for t, 
between 0 and 1. So this is a continuous map from the interval across the circle to the, uh, to, well, a priori to the complex numbers. And um, P of 0 is when T is 0, so that's x to the n. And P of 1, that's when T is 1, is the sum of these two things. That's our polynomial P. So this is a uh, map, a sort of homotopy between these two polynomial functions. But um, you can see by the same argument that we did before, that um, P sub T does not vanish on the unit circle, uh, sorry, on the circle of radius R, the same R that we chose before. Just exactly the same inequality, if you stare at it, it will tell you that it um, also tells us that this polynomial does not vanish on that um, on that same circle. So that means that um, P sub T divided by the absolute value of P sub T, so define so define omega sub T to be P sub t of x divided by P sub t of x absolute value. So this will be a map from the circle of radius r, so S1 to S1, and it will be a homotopy between gamma 0 and gamma 1. So gamma 0 is omega n, and gamma 1 is this new map. Okay. Now, if, if you have seen complex analysis, uh, you may recall something called the Rouchet's theorem. And the argument that we're doing is pretty much the same as Rouchet's theorem applied to uh, the polynomial x to the n and the polynomial p. OK, finally, point three. Now what I'm going to do is show that the path gamma 1 is actually homotopic to a point. OK? And this will prove the theorem. Why is that? So we'll prove gamma 1 is homotopic to a point. to the base point, to the constant map equal to the base point. So suppose we do this, why would this imply the theorem? Well, what do we have? We had two paths, OK, gamma 0 and gamma 1. OK, so gamma 0 is homotopic to omega n. Gamma 1 is this path that was built out of the polynomial p, which we're trying to prove has a root. And now we are saying that on one hand, omega 0 is homotopic to omega, uh, sorry, gamma 0 is homotopic to uh, omega n. Gamma 0 is homotopic to gamma 1, which is so that, and now I'm claiming that on the other hand, gamma 1 is homotopy to a point. So the conclusion is that n has to be 0, which is to say that the degree of the polynomial was 0, and it, that is to say the polynomial is a non-zero constant. Or to put it another way, if the, if the degree is bigger than 0, this is a contradiction. And therefore, the polynomial cannot have 
uh, must have a root. Okay, so the last thing we need to do, so this implies that n must be zero, and this is a contradiction because the degree was assumed to be bigger than zero. Now, so how do we show that we actually have a homotopy between gamma one and a point? So this is yet one last trick. So consider um, P, uh, maybe I'll call it um, Q sub T to be the polynomial P sub a P of T X. Okay, and um, so actually maybe we'll do P times T R X. So if T goes from zero to one, Okay, so think of our radius r circle. If this is x, we are going to be considered the, the values of the polynomial um, in sort of smaller and smaller circles as t goes from 1 to 0. So if t is 1, um, we get... Um, Actually, I think this is not what I want. What do I want? Uh, this, let me just define it like this, 0 to r. And so if p is equal to um, one, I think it's just, it was all right. It's t, for, so t is equal to 1. I have um, q of 1x is p. And if, q, if t is equal to 0, I have p of 0. Right? So this is a um, homotopy. And to look at things that um, are the final of the circle, I have to divide by the absolute value. So I can say because P does not vanish anywhere by assumption, if P doesn't vanish anywhere, then um, we can define the homotopy sigma sub t to be q sub t of x divided by the absolute value of q t of x. This is a well-defined homotopy of the path gamma 1, which is what we get if t is 1, and a point for um, at point 1 for t equal to 0. So if um, t is 1, we get the polynomial is p of x, and we get p of x divided by the absolute value of p. That's how we define uh, our path gamma 1. And if t is 0, q of 0 is the constant p 0, which is assumed not to be 0 since it doesn't vanish, p doesn't vanish anywhere by assumption. So we get this over uh, that as a constant divided by the absolute value, well, maybe it's a sign. Um, so it's a point. I don't care what it is. Um, and so what we get is that gamma 1 is indeed I homotopic to a point. And um, the conclusion is then omega n is homotopic to gamma 1, which is homotopic to a point which implies that n is 0. OK, so I think I, is that clear? Is there questions um, on the uh, argument? So we did it in three steps. First, we showed that the polynomial 
uh, cannot vanish in a big enough circle, and that's a useful fact to know regardless of proving this theorem or not, and we have a precise description of the radius. Uh, then we showed that construct, we can construct two paths by using the polynomials x to the n on one hand and p on the other, and we showed that the two paths constructed both from these polynomials are homotopic, whereas, and the first one is omega n. Finally, uh, the path constructed with the polynomial p, we showed it, assuming it doesn't vanish anywhere, that is homotopic to a point, and the conclusion then is that the degree had to be zero. So, I hope I didn't make too much of a mess of it, but it's a nice application of um, uh, algebraic topology that we get as a conclusion from the fact that we know things about the fundamental group of the circle, uh, we get the conclusion that the uh, a polynomial must have a root if it's not constant. Okay. Another thing I wanted to discuss is uh, a bit more about the torus. So the two torus, we said that this is isomorphic to the Cartesian product of two circles. I argued um, that the fundamental group of the torus at uh, some point is isomorphic to z cross z. And graphically, we can do this in two different ways. On one hand, we can def look at the torus in the standard uh, picture. And then um, we can describe a generators for the fundamental group that correspond to um, so these two loops A and B that go around each one of these circles in this Cartesian product, starting going uh, through one big fixed base point. And so this homomorphism, the isomorphism is a bit precise and more precise than just saying that it's isomorphic. We can see that A in this uh, choice, say goes to one zero and B goes to zero one. Okay. So it might be worth uh, thinking about what these paths look like. I um, mentioned a little bit of this last time, but um, for example, let's try to look at what's the homotopy class of, say, the pair two, three. So this is sort of an abstract thing that we've done. Um, we, this is a, a statement about any Cartesian product of spaces and the fact that we now know, we have proved that the fundamental group of the circle is, is the integer. So the conclusion is that the fundamental group of the torus is the integers cross the integers. And we can be a bit more precise as to how that map uh, works. But um, it means that if I pick a pair of integers over this side, it corresponds to some homotopy class of path on the, on the torus. So let's try to, to get a sense of how that works by um, trying to draw what um, the path corresponding, say, to the element 2, 3 looks like. Okay. So maybe you can tell me. What do you think it... It looks like. So once you decide which direction is A and what direction is B, it will say go twice in this direction. And that's the A, like that. And then it has to go three times in this direction. OK, I, I, it's hard, and I'm not sure I'm going to try, but you can see a picture in Hatcher uh, to actually give you a sort of 3D version of the path, which is I think is useful to, for intuitions. but. There's also another way to uh, deal with the torus that is helpful, and is to think of it as a identification of size of a square. Okay, so you've seen I think this before. If you call this the a 
si uh, side, this is the B side, what um, this means is that the B is identified with orientations uh, with itself. So if you take, you cannot do this with a sheet of paper because it doesn't fit flat in this in 3D. Okay, so you can do one and of the foldings, but not both. So if you take this sheet of paper, you can f identify these two sides and make a cylinder. Okay. Now what we have to do is take this disc and identify it with that one, with that circle over here, and that will give us the torus. But of course, you cannot do this with a sheet of paper without breaking it because the torus is just not flat. Okay, so, but I can fold it this way, which would be the other identification, or I can fold it this way. Okay, so the two identifications actually are what we need to do, but I cannot do them physically with a sheet of paper at the same time. But um, with this, then uh, some things have become a little easier to digest. So. Uh, if I were to draw the simplest, simplest possible path that corresponds to the class, sorry, whose class corresponds to the pair 2, 3, what would be, if I were to picture it here, what would it look like? I mean, of course, the homotopy class does not determine the path, but we can think of the simplest possible path with that feature. Just like with the circle, there are plenty of paths that have um, homotopy class of omega n, but the simplest one is omega n. So one thing I should stress, I mean, when you think of this, uh, these problems is one typically draws you know, paths that look very well behaved. You know, you, omega n just goes around two circles. And pre, pre, but the path, of course, could be completely crazy, right? You could go back a zillion times and then go a zillion back, and it could still be homotopically trivial. So paths themselves are very flabby things. I mean, they could be all over the place. Uh, when we talk about the fundamental group, we talk about the homotopy class, which is something a lot more rigid, more restricted. Anyway, so what would be a path whose homotopy class mapped through this isomorphism corresponds to the number, the pair two, three? Any thoughts? Yes, we have to put two such kind of picture in direction three and Okay. So he's saying we take this picture and we do it twice in one direction and three in a different direction. So in the A we're gonna do it twice. Hmm? Well, there's A is 2, right? So A goes to 1, 0, am I right? Let's see. I either get it right or I get it exactly backwards, which is possible. Um, so what do the does the path look like? I had a picture done myself, if I can find it. I think we may take any path from zero, zero to two, three. Anybody is he saying that we can take any path that goes from zero, zero to two, three in these coordinates? Any people agree with that? Yes? Okay, good. We're using lifting property. Okay, so let me take the simplest possible path that goes from one point to another, namely a line. Okay, is that the loop? So this point is equivalent to this point which is equivalent to this point, which is equivalent to that point, that point, that point. So if you do all the identifications, this will be the um, same point. Now, if we were to draw this in only one circle, in only one square, well, we can look at, um, look at this square, right? This is going to be, 
two-thirds of the way. So this is the picture here, right? Now, um, this continues into this picture, which if I bring it down, it means that I identify this point with that, and then it goes to um, probably half. If I want to take that picture and put it in one square, I identify this square with that one, and so what I see in the square is this little thing. And so um, this is the same as this point, which will go here. Okay? So if I want to keep track of this, I'm going like this, like this, then moving over to there. And then from here, the next one is from here to there. Okay, so if we, and I think we may have done this backwards now that I look at it. Um, so if this, in one square, this um, loop looks like, like that. So let's see. Um, it crosses this horizontal axis um, at this point, this point, and this point. That one is the same as that one. So it cuts it three times. And um, in the vertical axis, it cuts it only here and there, and that one is the same as that. So I think we got exactly 3, 2 with this. So in fact, um, this class, the class of this path, if I'm not mistaken, should correspond under this isomorphism to the integers 3, 2. Because it goes three times in the um, A direction and two times in the B direction. Is that, am, I, am I right? There's a small chance that I'm backwards. Okay, I'll, I find myself having a hard time thinking on my feet, so I'll leave that to you. And if I'm wrong, please let me know next, next time. Okay, so I, should, I suggest you play with this type of things and get familiarized with what's going on because this captures a lot of what um, is necessary to understand the concept we're discussing. These examples... Um, capture a lot of the details, and uh, is, is a good idea to be familiar with, with these, uh, I wouldn't say simple, but sort of basic examples to make sure the concepts are, are uh, you know, in, you, you sort of uh, incorporate them as uh, natural things you don't have to think every time. Okay, so one last thing I want to do with the torus is that if A if I abuse the notation a little bit, A is the class of one of the circles and B is the class of the other circle, then in particular, a consequence of this statement that, that the fundamental group is Z cross Z says that A and B commute because the group is commutative, Z cross Z. So that means that the class of A, B and A inverse B inverse should be what? Should be trivial. So that means that if I take the circle in one direction, followed by the circle in the other direction, and then I do the two things backwards, I should get a path that's homotopic to it, the identity. So it might be a good thing to actually see that. Okay, so um, let's go back to our square picture. So this is A and A and B and B. How would the commutator, A, B, A, inverse, B, inverse, look like as a path? Well, it's, we do A first, and the quotient, of course, is a loop, but here it got unfolded as, as, because we are seeing uh, some of this lifting, prop, I mean, covering property. 
So A, we do from here to here. Then we do B. Then we do A inverse, which is going, is going through A backwards. And then we do B inverse. So in this picture, the whole commutator path can be described as simply going around the circle in a loop, as he was saying. Now, how do we see what the homotopy is? Or what is a possible homotopy to show that indeed it is uh, the trivial class? If you, if you were, had to actually write down the homotopy, which is not the, what you typically do, but if somebody tells you, no, I actually want to see the function, write it down for me. I mean, abstractly, we know this is the case, but I actually want to see the homotopy. So we want to take this path and slowly deform it until it looks like a point. Right? It's homotopic to the constant path, uh, whatever base point you like, uh, in the because um, that's the trivial class in the fundamental group. So let's say this is our base point. Um, just to fix ideas. It's much simpler than you may think. If so what we could just do is slightly deform the path like this. Okay, so that thing that I drew is a path in the torus. And um, is homotopic. I mean, we have to, we would have to, if you really wanted to write this down, we have to sit down and write some uh, formulas down. And we just keep doing this. So you basically take the path and you see it shrinking until it becomes a point. And in fact, um, if you search for animation torus, I can give you a link if you like. Somebody actually wrote a little um, uh, Java applet that illustrates this. So on one hand, you see the square. So what happens in these coordinates? And then the other, you actually see it on the, on the donut. What is the path at each time? Okay. Okay, now um, let's move on to a yet another application or another calculation, which is useful, and that is um, a statement about the fundamental group of the sphere in n dimensions. And if the dimension is 1, that's a circle, and we computed that to be z. If dimension is 0, well, what, what's the sphere of dimension 0? <laughs> huh? How many points? Two points, two points, right? So that is not even connected. When you go to a circle, it's connected, but it's not simply connected. It has one loop that you cannot, you know, essential loop you cannot retract. What happens if you go S2? Any loop should be homotopic to identity, and you can imagine what it is. You just draw it. If you have a simple little thing that you can see, what you do is basically think of a, this is a lasso, and you sort of pull the string, and you collapse it to a point. That should be at least intuitively clear that the fundamental group of the two-sphere should be trivial. And in fact, it's trivial for any other n. OK? So if you think of the fundamental group as an invariant, it allows you to distinguish the circle from any other bigger sphere. 
that they cannot be homeomorphic because one has fundamental group Z and the other ones don't. Okay? Um, so if you wanted to distinguish spheres, if you want to prove that two spheres of different dimension are not homeomorphic, you would have to have a bigger tool because this one doesn't see. For the pi one, they just all of the spheres look the same. They look like trivial, uh, have trivial fundamental group. Okay, so the proof of this, it's uh, in a sense it's simple, but there's um, a little technicality one has to go around to uh, completely prove it. Well, let me ask you, what would you do to prove this? Think of just the regular two-sphere. How would you actually prove that the two-sphere is simply connected, that has fun trivial fundamental group? I mean, again, intuitively it's fairly clear, but if you actually want to write a proof, one has to do something. Okay, we have it in R3, fine, it's there. Could project it to R2. Project it to R2, yes. and what happens then? We will take off one point somewhere, uh, one point of the spray, and we put it stereographic projection to R2. So what he's suggesting is that we do a, a stereographic projection to R2. Are you all familiar with that notion? So we take the sphere and we put a plane through the middle and we look at the sphere from, say, up here and we draw lines and um, they, will, um, they will hit this sphere somewhere and um, correspond to points in the plane, and there's only one point that doesn't have um, a thing corresponding to it, which is this point itself. Okay, so the conclusion we want to get from this is that if we take um, the sphere and remove a point, then we can homeomorphically map it to R2. And the same thing works for any sphere of a higher dimension. You can do precisely the same type of construction and see that um, the sphere minus a point is um, homeomorphic to Rn. In general. Okay, is that prove it? Let's go back. What are we trying to do? We're trying to prove that the fundamental group of the sphere is trivial for dimensions two and higher. So say, let's concentrate. The idea will be essentially the same for all cases, so let's just concentrate on two for now. How would you prove that the two sphere is simply connected? We just uh, saw that if we miss a point, then um, it looks like R2, and R2 we know is simply connected. Is this enough to show that the sphere is simply connected? Yes? No? Maybe? <laughs> Depends on the weather. Okay, you say yes. Well, why do you say yes?
So what he's saying is we take a loop, we project it down to R2, find a homotopy there to a point, and then bring that back. And it's all right except for one little problem. What if the loop always goes to that point? I mean, what if you're just unlucky and the, I take a path that actually goes to this point that I excluded? Yeah, so I, the base point is somewhere, but my path, I actually make it go through the point you use for your projection. Take the assumption that the point, uh, the loop does not. Okay, so you're suggesting, well, take a point that is not on the loop. Everybody happy with that? No, you should not be happy because there are paths that go through every point of the sphere. Okay, so you cannot do this argument yet because the path just might be completely fill out the sphere. It could be completely surjective. This is counterintuitive, but there are such space filling curves. So if you do that, if you have, if somebody brings you that path, then you're stuck. Your argument doesn't work. But what's the saving grace? We don't care about paths. We care about homotopy classes of paths. So somebody brings to you this nasty path and you change it. So what we would have to show is that if you have any path, you can always homotopy it so that it misses at least one point. Okay, now we, that's where we're getting to. But, okay, this at least is a strategy. Okay, but, but it's also driving, hopefully driving in the point that the paths are not the thing we really care about. What we care about are their homotopy classes. Okay? So, um, so if the path misses a point, use use it, point P, use P to project to Rn and use Rn is simply connected. Okay, if gamma does not miss a point, find another path in its class that does. Okay, and this looks hard to do, but in fact it isn't too bad. And we'll probably end with that. Okay, so how to do this? Okay, so take your favorite point X. That is not the base point, right? Because the base point, the path definitely is going to go with the base point because it's a base point. Take a little ball B around X, centered at X. So <clears throat> the picture is something like this. Here's our X. Here's a little ball. And in Rn, uh, yes. Uh, no, no, in the, in the sphere. In the sphere. 
So ball meaning, think of it as a little disk. And um, so now let's think of the path. You know, it's just all kinds of branches of the path are going in and out of that sphere. Uh, and, uh, you know, say lots of them are going through X. What we want to do is take the path and slightly move it inside B so that they, it misses X. And then everything else on the path will leave it as it is. So the homotopy is only going to do a little damage to the path in this ball. And what we're going to do is move the, little, the strings that go through x a little bit so they, they miss x. And a priori the difficulty is, well, there could be infinitely many things that go through x, in which case it's going to be hard to argue that you can move them all within a homotopy. But in fact, there's only finally many one that do. And so we, we can, by sort of iteratively, move the little branches one at a time. And that will uh, be a, um, that would result in a homotopy that, um, that will, in the end, give us a path that misses x altogether. OK, so here we do have to use, I mean, after all, we have an interval that always ultimately is going to play a role. The, the, Pass our mass from the interval to the space. So let's take um, gamma is our path. Take gamma inverse of B. So this is a little open ball. So this is some open set of the interval. Um, and is in fact the open interval 0, 1, because I can take the ball small enough so that it doesn't contain x0. x0 is outside the ball. And um, right, so the values of the, of the path gamma at 0 and 1 are x0. OK, so this open set is a disjoint union of open intervals, AI to BI. And they contain gamma inverse of x. So what kind of set is gamma inverse of x? Let's be careful. What is gamma inverse of x? It's all the values of the parameter s which land you into x. There could be many. OK? But then what's the nature of the set x, the gamma inverse of x? Hmm? Is X itself is a closed set. Gamma inverse of X is a is compact. It's bounded. 
It's in the interval 0, 1, and it's closed. Yes? Well, we're going in steps. Gamma x, gamma inverse of x is compact. Ah, so you, want, you want to use gamma is continuous. Of course. Yes, yes. Gamma inverse is compact. Everybody happy with that? And this, sort of, rather than I, I, I misled you by writing it belongs to, it sort of contains. This is a set. So it's a compact set covered by these um, open sets. So it has to be covered by finally many. Hence, meets only finally many of the AIBI. And now we're basically out of the woods because now what we just showed is what we were saying would work. That is to say that the little, all these branches of gamma that could possibly go through B meet our point X in only finally many times. And so um, what we could do is just take, um, so more precisely, If we um, let gamma i be the path gamma restricted to the interval i i b i, this goes from a i b i to the closure of b, <coughs> and the endpoints are where? Well, the open interval maps over to the B. So if we add the endpoints of the interval, they are going to map to points on the boundary of the B. So if we try to think of this in a, as a picture, here's our X down there. Let's say this is a point gamma i, let's maybe give some names, a i is x i and gamma i of b i is y i, or maybe x i zero and uh, x one i. So here's x zero i and there's uh, x i one. Okay, so the path does something and goes through x Okay, it goes from one point in the boundary, goes through x, and then comes back and hits uh, the boundary again. So now what we can do is simply move this path up all the way to the boundary of the ball, say, and still having a continuous map. But now it just doesn't go through x. Okay, so we can push this uh, little strand of gamma. Excuse me? Uh, I was going to write now. Um, yeah, I was uh, going to write it here. So, um, so push this strand of gamma to the boundary of B and repeat. So um, finally many times. And that's the crucial thing that this process will give you trouble if you try to do this infinitely often. So repeat finally many times to get a homotopic path avoiding x. Ha! So that's a clever argument. And now once we know that we have a path that doesn't go through x, we, yes? Sorry? 
sorry, this is a gamma, excuse me. My, so take the previous path that we had before, the, the path that, Two, two. T O, two. The word, English word two. So uh, say, just take the, the path, sort of go through X inside the ball. So push it over. <laughs> Sorry, is that, is that clear now? Sorry. No, it wasn't mathematics, it was English. <laughs> okay, so is that clear then? So this is a nice, clever argument and um, avoids this. Uh, pitfall of having a path that covers the entire ball and would give us the trouble as the entire sphere. So um, what we did then is make a homotopy from the path that is annoying to a path that we can deal with and then use the argument that we started with. So this shows that um, the, the uh, spheres of higher dimension are, are, are simply connected. Now, we should be careful. Where did we use that n was at least 2? Because if this were, um, if we did this with S1, what would be the problem? We would have a, well, there we certainly have plenty of paths that are completely surjective, right? Uh, what we, where would we fail when we try to avoid a point? We take this little ball, try to avoid the, the x, but um, everything else will work, but um, this, this, we couldn't be able to do this deformation to the boundary, as he's saying, because the boundary consists of two points. Okay, so, um, yeah, so that one has to be careful in stating, you know, I just basically wrote down, but in words, but if you uh, want to be, write this more carefully, you have to, of course, verify that this can be done, and that's where you need that n is at least two. Okay, so the fundamental group of spheres, a higher spheres, is trivial. Um, we'll continue next week, and I'll give you some homework uh, for you to uh, work on. Uh, I'm not sure what's the standard about uh, grading, but at least, again, this should be for you, not for me, so try to think of them, and uh, if you need, have questions and you want to come to talk to me in my office, I'll be happy to discuss them. Okay. Thank you.